our dreamer today is a 58-year-old male, and his occupation is a tour operator. He says he's English, but he is currently living in Spain. And he titles his dream, The Seven Demons. I've been invited to a party or reunion. I'm back in London, and I'm with my friend, T. I'm happy to see him. There is the same feeling of wild elation in the air that I experienced at times when I was living in London in my 20s, a dangerous sensation of almost complete abandon. We are drinking in a bar, and the next day I wake up and find three tattoos on the side of my calf <laughs> of my right leg of three phrases, but I can't decipher what they say. Underneath is the tattoo parlor's name. I'm annoyed about the tattoos, but think I'll be able to get some compensation from the parlor because I must have been unconscious when I got them. <laughs> I talk about this with T, who was with me. I can't blame him because we were all drunk or high, and I think it's not a big deal. It's the next day. I'm with T, and he is cooking up an experiment. It's exciting, but there is a sense of danger. We are in an old room with flaking plaster on the walls and old pine benches on either side of the room with high wooden stools under them. On the benches, each of the benches are three or four piles of darkish sand, seven in total. The piles of sand are not big, but they are incubating something like eggs. One starts to move. I'm nervous. T says, don't worry and starts scraping away the sand, hurrying the hatching process. Inside, it is a red-skinned man. He comes out. Now he's life-size, and I see he has pointed ears. He is a devil, and I'm terrified. Though T is excited, and the fact that he isn't scared seems to protect him, and perhaps me, from the risk. The devil is elated to be free, he exudes self-assurance and purpose and has an immense charisma. He goes around the other piles, helping the others out. The others are not as red as him. Some are blotchy. Some have been asleep for eons. I think the one bench diagonally opposite, furthest from the main devil, is my father. He has slight red blotches like birthmarks and seems less dangerous and not as happy to be reawakened as the main devil, though they are of the same mold. It is like the awakening of vampires, and I am afraid. The dreamer gives us some context, and he writes, When I was 15, I fell out with my father. I went to London at 18 and lived a pretty wild life of experimenting with drugs until I was 27 when I decided that I'd had enough. T, in the dream, was one of the few friends who I enjoyed a kind of complete hedonistic abandon with. It was a time of excess, which was costly in terms of regret of wasted opportunities at the time when I could have been putting more in and getting more out of life. My father died in 2020 after a long illness. We both decided to accept that we were different and got on. But we were never as close as I think both of us would have liked to have been. Listening to Joseph's account of his own father's death in a couple of podcasts mm -hmm. brings up a lot of emotion for me, feelings of grief, love, and regret. And he adds that his feelings in the dream were fear and awe at the devil and his huge charisma, annoyance at the tattoo. I don't have tattoos and personally don't like them if they are not of a tribal community. And then he adds a bit more saying, I associate the tattoo with the unconsciousness of my hedonistic twenties and the mark they left on me. I was afraid and in awe of the devil. I felt pity at seeing my father awaken when he didn't seem to want to. <sighs> Uh, 
Well, I um, I thought when I saw this dream this morning, I thought, wow, this is just really a, kind of a blockbuster dream. And, uh, and it's a difficult dream. There's a lot in here. But I, I'll start, I'll take a first pass at it by saying this. Sometimes when you have dreams that have two parts to them that seem pretty different, it can be interesting to sort of assume that they treat the same subject from two slightly different perspectives. So we have, the, mm-hmm. this is a two-part dream. The first part is the tattoos, and the second part is, you know, this kind of uh, alchemical experiment or something. Mm-hmm. And what I notice is the same about them, other than the uh, presence of tea. Um, is that they both have to do with awakenings. Mm. So in the first part, the dreamer wakes up and has this epiphany Mm -hmm. that he has gotten these tattoos apparently when he was unconscious. The second part, Mm -hmm. obviously the devils are awakening, but the dream ego is also kind of awakening to some realities. So that... that, uh, that maybe deepens the meaning. For example, he said the t- tattoos he associates, and I think it's fairly obvious, you know, that the tattoos might refer to the way that that experience in his 20s kind of left their mark on him in an unfortunate way. Mm-hmm. Understanding that, yeah. uh, the, laying it on top of the second half of the dream kind of deepens our understanding that a little bit. I'm going back uh, to um, just noticing that the age of the dreamer, uh, he's, he's in his late 50s now, and the dream starts by saying, uh, I've been invited to a party or a reunion of, mm. of revisiting uh, this time when he and his friend T, um, you know, had their days of what we used to call sowing their wild oats. So it's a reunion, and uh, he is marked by the tattoos, and he doesn't like tattoos. And not only that, he has uh, the the tattoo parlor's name, you know. So it's it's not it's sort of like he's uh, wearing a brand, uh, sort of like the the uh, the devil wears Prada kind of thing. And and he has to wake up to this. And then his friend is doing this incubation process of, of eggs. And what comes out is what we might call shadow and certainly his father complex. And here is the time for him to see this uh, as dream images, confront it and, and deal with it at, from a different stage of life. Uh, that these are devils, he's terrified. And yeah, it's there's like a lot the of awakening. archetypal power. Right. Vampires are very archetypal. They have no feeling, and they have to live off others' life source, which is the symbolic meaning of blood. Uh, and I would be very curious as to why now. Yeah. That, that that's a, that's an interesting question, Deb. And I think you're right. Mm-hmm. I think this is kind of revisiting something. Mm-hmm. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go one more round. I can tell that Joseph is cooking something over there. Yes, <laughs> but, <laughs> as he often does. He's cooking. But he's I, I cooking just, eggs. <laughs> oh yes, devilish Joseph. Um, so I want to just make one point, which is. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually pull in the idea of the Freudian slip. Um, okay. The dreamer wrote Joseph didn't read it this way, but the dreamer wrote about his twenties being a time of almost complete abandon. I think is what he meant, but he wrote almost mm. complete abandonment. Mm. And I note that he he fell out with his father when he was fifteen. 
and and then we don't i'm in my in my imagination dad didn't do much to repair that and mm-hmm. i wonder if the dreamer felt that or this the the surrounding of it even though it may have felt like he left i i my my supposition is that he felt tremendously abandoned and that mm-hmm. that was a time of having been abandoned it was an abandonment that he mm-hmm. responded to with a kind of dangerous abandon which then marked him and i think you're right deb something's coming back and it is interesting to mm-hmm. to ask why now yeah uh what he actually writes is hedonistic abandon with so he well, found a an... go ahead yeah but he does use the term abandonment but both but he yes. also abandons with his yeah. friend T. So mm-hmm. here's another ma- a relationship with a masculine figure. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. the masculine figure is a peer. You know, they're yeah. pretty much the same, the same age. There's no real, you know, uh, more life development or more maturity. Oh, oh. that's a great point. Then T abandon uh, yeah. abandons him in the dream to the exactly. tattoo parlor. He says, yes. well, I can't blame T, but T was with him and apparently let mm-hmm. the tattoos happen. So that's a good point. Yeah. And T also lets all these devilish characters, he's the one that is incubating them. So I'm really curious about what you're thinking, Joseph, as our resident alchemist. Well, I'm, uh, I'll tell you what's uh, percolating is that I think the dream is part of the archetype of the book of Revelation. Hmm. And if we recognize that the word apocalypse, which is often misunderstood, actually means revelation. And an apocalyptic revelation Hmm. um, suggests a revelation of such magnitude that the old world is thrown into discord. So in the book of Revelation, There is a time when the great beast reigns supreme, and those who succumb to that receive Mm. the mark of the beast, which is a kind of tattoo on their body. Yeah. Uh Another aspect of the book of Revelation is that there are seven seals that are broken. Mm -hmm. And when each of the seal is broken, Ah. a, a horseman of destruction, but also a horseman of change. Mm -hmm. The first Mm -hmm. symbol uh, seal is the white horse and symbolizes the conqueror. The second is the red Mm. horse and is the horse of war and removes peace from the world. And then the black horse is famine and the pale Mm. horse is death. And, uh, And so it moves on. So each of the seven seals erupts each of the seven piles of sands hatches and something that is frightening is revealed but um, one could make a good case for an analysis of the book of revelation as a profound and often frightening spiritual awakening which sounds in many ways like a kundalini rising and the activation Mm -hmm. of the seven chakras and when these unconscious vortices become suddenly superpowered mm-hmm. and then they erupt there's an enormous amount of unconscious material that floods mm. the individual that suddenly you know has to somehow be dealt with mm-hmm. and often there's a, an enormous amount of tension and strife and and shock conflict uh, conflict massive conflict <laughs> If this proceeds yeah. in the right way, what there is a new Jerusalem suspended yeah. in the heavens, mm-hmm. which descends like a great cube into the earth or onto the earth, and the Lamb of God is the great illuminating force, which is a symbol of a new personality where the self is the primary vital spark mm-hmm. of the new personality at the end of it. So. I would wonder if the um, beginning process of being dissolute, Mm -hmm. 
in a certain way and enjoying mm-hmm. it as we often do in mm-hmm. our 20s just as he said, has left the quote-unquote mark of the beast on him. And he's mm-hmm. curious about that. And yeah. whether or not that's something that he's okay with, T is a kind of psychopomp in the dream that yeah. companions the ego through this dissolute time, does not mm-hmm. interfere with his unconscious choice to receive the mark, but is mm-hmm. present to it. The dream ego at times seems like he'd like to put the authority or onus on someone else. Oh, it's not me, it's the tattoo parlor, you know. Mm-hmm. Somebody else kind of dragged me along for something rather than now I have right. to suffer. But the psychopomp T does this remarkable, like you said, alchemical process or apocalyptic process of displaying at least the seven piles of sand and what is inside of this fellow that hatches. Mm -hmm. The red devil is part of that libidinal dynamism. And if we remember that the devil, Mm -hmm. at least in Christianity, is modeled very explicitly off the pagan Pan, who is the great libidinal engine of nature which Mm -hmm. uh, stood very much at odds with the very conscious, restrained process of of Christianity. One is supposed to put all of that primal stuff away in order to lead a pure life. So there's a different attitude about Pan. Pan emerges Mm -hmm. from the sand and now is kind of devilish and scary and dangerous. That's different from the first half of life when Pan was the great shameless companion Hmm. um, who was like leading us into this Arcadian world of drink and excess. (laughs) But here there's a different, or I think the beginning of a certain moral stance, which is, I don't know if that stuff is really good for me. And that might actually be more of a devilish impulse that I have to kind of figure out whether or not I stand against that whether or not I go with it, what, what, does, what does that mean? And of course, in the mm-hmm. moment, he's anxious. That fear of pan could also be the beginning of wisdom. When we're young, mm-hmm. all that libidinal yeah. wildness, which I know very well, God knows, yeah. all of that <laughs> drunken waking up, like what the heck happened stuff. Yes, it is euphoric, and we call it dissolute because it is a great salutio. You know, our, mm-hmm. our ego dissolves into this ecstatic, instinctive pool. Mm-hmm. So the devil comes out of the sand, and the guy's like, oh, oh, what a, <laughs> what's my relationship to that now that I see it? Perhaps in this other way. The progression of figures that emerges seems to have less and less of the devilishness in it yeah. until the final... Uh, people, including his father, just have little red patches on them. Mm-hmm. There's just a little bit of devilishness in it mm-hmm. instead of just the full possession of the devilishness. Mm-hmm. And what it suggests to me, and perhaps is the beginning of some healing work with the father complex, is that the dreamer is like his father in as much as he too has devilish patches on him. Mm-hmm. But it is... It is only a part of him, that, that mm-hmm. it is not a full possession of the devilish, unbridled instinctiveness, but kind of a rash, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And we can mm-hmm. imagine the red rash of the father and the way that all of us have a devilish rash that rises up in us and we become highly mm-hmm. instinctive which could be very renewing sometimes, but can also get us into a lot of trouble, depending on what our relationship is to the impulses. Uh, I I love what you did, Joseph. I I think that's just, (laughs) you come up with this stuff, I'm like, wow, I never in a million years would have gone there. That's just great. Um, And I'm I'm gonna just walk around it in a slightly different way, I think, Mm -hmm. Not, not in any way contradicting anything you said, but but maybe just um, 
sharpening my own sword here. Uh, you know, my fantasy is that uh, there was this incredibly painful rupture with the father that the dreamer never really allowed himself to feel. He mm-hmm. says, uh, just to go back to it for a minute, he says, um, when I was 15, I fell out with my father. He's kind of putting it all on himself. I went to London at 18 and I lived this pretty wild life. Um, my father died in 2020 after a long illness. We both decided to accept that we were different and got on, but we were never as close as, as I think we both wanted to be. So somehow there was this really remarkable rupture at a young age that it seemed like it was like, oh, well, you know, we're just different. We're just going to agree to disagree. And I imagine that there's a lot of unmetabolized pain around that and probably also some unmetabolized anger. And I like what you said about T being a psychopomp. I think he's also, in a, if we're going to talk about kind of classical Jungian formulation, he's a shadow figure. And he, mm. he is leading the dreamer through this dissolute time in the 20s, which, which in some sense I think was a real reaction to the break with the father. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go mm. kind of, um, for, you know, numb myself basically to this awareness and kind of live in this slightly self-destructive way as we sometimes do when we've suffered a, a real kind of traumatic break. And... And then T is the one that says, you know, this is not going to stay buried under, sta- under sand. You know, we're, we, you, there's going to be a confrontation here. And that is, you know, sometimes shadow makes us look at what we don't want to look at. And, and part of that is this red hot anger, this devilish anger that I imagine maybe the dreamer has been afraid of his own mm-hmm. anger. He's afraid of the devil. And like you said, it kind of devolves and then it's his father. So it's it's like, the whole panoply of uh, confusing feelings about this father relationship, all the way down to like pity. He's just an old guy who wants to stay dead. But, you know, in the dreamer psyche, he's not dead. This is still a conflict that's very much alive and is continuing to influence the dreamer, I think. Mm hmm. Uh, I, too, was really amazed uh, that you could take it to the Book of Revelation (laughs) and the Seven Seals, um, because there's something reassuring when there's really an archetypal theme, uh, that this is part of universal human experience, uh, all kinds of mythology, and that the first figure that emerges is this full-blown red man, the devil, but as other figures emerge, they're blotchier, they're more humanized, mm-hmm. promising that it, these are metabolizable. Uh, th- this is stuff you're ready to deal with. And then I think the telos, the promise that you mentioned, Joseph, is the new Jerusalem, the new beginning, is where Psyche says, time to go there. And I think what tickled my imagination was that in one of the podcasts that I had said that in the final moment of my father's life, the night before he died, he was kind of petting my hand and was saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. I am going to Jerusalem. That's right. I don't know if the dreamer remembers that particular story, but I did. So so I I found myself thinking about the new Jerusalem, Jerusalem, seven piles of sand, and the way those synchronicities just tickle together. Wow. That's yes. amazing. But what I love what we did is that there's an amplification part, which mm-hmm. is really interesting, the seven seals. But also, Lisa Deb, you guys tied it into this very human dynamic that we also could see. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and it's all um It's all mixed. there. It's all there. It's all, yeah. it's all, it's all there. Suggestively there, which lets us know that our personal suffering also has a deep and archetypal dimension to it, which is exactly. why it's so meaningful. And it has a and in terms, and in ter- Right. And in terms of telos, there's that lovely synchronicity, Joseph, that you just brought up about the new Jerusalem. I also want to say that the devil, the little devil coming out of this egg mm-hmm. reminds me a bit of Mercurius, the, the kind of spirit in the bottle uh, right. from the Grimm's fairy tale which is, you know, this incredibly powerful force 
that must be channeled correctly. But when it's channeled correctly, as in the Grimm's fairy tale, the, the, I think it's called The Spirit in the Bottle, um, it gives, the, the gift that it gives is healing. It can heal anything. So uh, that is also Telos there. <laughs> Thank you.